Well, welcome. Good morning. I'm actually going to sit down if you don't mind. I think it feels a lot more intimate with uh, just being in a, a small room here, and I'm sure uh, you're all feeling the same there at home. So I'm just going to sit here and share with you. And I want to encourage you to continue to pray because obviously, you know, we are in unprecedented times at the moment. And uh, today's actually been called as a National Day of Prayer and Fasting uh, for COVID-19. And every um, evening at uh, 7 o'clock, 7 p.m. is um, a designated time, 1,900 hours for COVID-19 uh, to pray. Uh, but we really need to just be praying constantly. That's what Paul encourages us to do, pray without ceasing and just continue to lift up our Prime Minister and uh, the State Premiers and just anyone that comes across your mind to be praying for. I've been praying for uh, you know people that work at Woolworths and Coles. I've been praying for the um, frontline uh, workers, doctors and nurses, and uh, just really uh, wanting to encourage you to continue to pray uh, for all those situations, for people that have lost work or had hours cut, um, even for the, the managers uh, and business owners that have had to make really difficult decisions over the last couple of weeks. Uh, so let's continue to pray for those uh, people and remember uh, them and continue to seek uh, God's face in this whole situation, that he would be working in us and through us in all that we do. Well, we certainly are living in a, a crazy times. You know, unprecedented is a word that uh, I've heard a lot over the last couple of weeks, and it really is uh, a very apt word, I think. It certainly is unprecedented. I'm, I'm sure that none of us have ever lived through a global pandemic, um, and I trust and pray that we never have to uh, live through another one either. But uh, I guess there are two ways that we can respond in times like this. We can either uh, respond... Uh, to the uncertainty, the hysteria, the, the bad news headlines that just keep you know, bombarding us every day. We can respond with fear or we can respond with faith. And I guess as believers with an eternal hope, we would uh, say that the right answer uh, would be that we would want to uh, respond in faith. But what does that actually look like? James sums it up well in James 2.17. He says, faith without works is dead. And I want to read that the whole passage, actually, because James makes some really good points uh, that I believe we can relate to our lives uh, from this passage. From James chapter 2, he says, What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or a sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, it, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. So allow me to put this uh, passage into a modern day paraphrase. Imagine if it said, suppose a brother or sister is without toilet paper or mints. If one of you says to them, Go in peace, keep clean and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs. What good is it? That sort of brings it a bit closer to home, doesn't it? Because we've all been uh, either in the same situation or we know people that have uh, been in that situation in the last little while. But I know, you know a number of people in the last month that have actually purchased toilet paper with the sole intent of having it available to give away to someone that needed it. I reckon that is faith in action right there. Another thing to note in this passage is that it says, suppose a brother or sister. What does that mean? That's talking about our church family, our Christian uh, believers, our family that are around us in the, the body of Christ. And Paul reinforces this idea when he said in Galatians 6 verse 10, he said, therefore, whenever we have the opportunity, we should do good to everyone, especially to those in the family of faith. There's another verse in Galatians which highlights the importance of caring uh, for people in these sorts of situations. Galatians 2, 9 and 10, Paul says, James, Peter and John, who were known as pillars of the church, recognised the gift God had given me and they accepted Barnabas and me as their co-workers. They encouraged us to keep preaching to the Gentiles while they continued their work with the Jews. Their only suggestion was that we keep on helping the poor, which I have always been eager to do. So it's interesting how helping the poor was a key part of the development of the early church. 
for both the Jewish and the Gentile believers. We know we tell our kids, caring is sharing, sharing is caring. And it is true, unless you've got COVID-19, we don't want you to be sharing that with us. <laughs> but uh, let's keep that to yourself. But, you know, sharing really is caring. And when we think of sharing, we think about making sure that everyone has enough. You know, if I was to, I probably should have actually brought some Tim Tams today to share with the people that are here. But if I was going to your place and was turning up with some Tim Tams, I would think ahead of time to make sure I had enough for everyone, enough to go around. Because you wouldn't want to turn up with, let's say I came to your place and there was eight people there and I turned up with seven Tim Tams. That'd be a bit awkward, wouldn't it? Because there wouldn't be enough to go around. Sharing is ensuring that there's enough to go around. Now, during our um, prayer and fasting that we did back in February, I read through during that week, I read through the book of Acts. And there was a, a verse in chapter four that really jumped out at me during that time. It's a ver uh, Acts 4, verse 32. It says, Now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. Neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. So these early Christians really were sharing and caring. And keep in mind that this is in a time where there wasn't a, a social security, there wasn't a safety net that people could fall back onto if they got into strife. People relied on their immediate family for support. If they didn't have kids or a spouse, they were in trouble if they got um, you know, if they were without food and without any resource. Right. It wouldn't have been uncommon for people to die because of a lack of food and other basic essentials. But all of a sudden we see this group spring up. The new uh, Christians, the early church forms, and they're selling properties. They're pooling resources and caring for anyone within the group who had any needs. And the amazing thing is that this was completely voluntary. It wasn't like it was organized by the apostles, it was just a voluntary thing that just started to happen uh, within this group. So why do you think they were being so generous so suddenly? I believe that it's because they had a revelation of the incredible love that God had showed them. When he sent his son to earth to die for us, they had that revelation of the, the generosity, the love of God, and that was uh, playing out in their lives as well. When they recognized the extravagance of it, they were compelled to live the same way. How attractive do you think that would have been for those around watching this early church meeting and caring for each other's needs? It would have been incredibly attractive. And Jesus said to his disciples in John 13, 34, he said, so now I'm giving you a new commandment. Love each other. Yeah. Just as I have loved you, you should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. Amen. So think back on the last week. Can you remember times when you've loved others? Maybe it was someone in your immediate family. Maybe it was a neighbor or a workmate. Maybe it was a complete stranger. As we love those around us, we're actually spreading the love of Christ to the world. And remember that as we love our church family, this is actually showing the world that you are a disciple of Christ. Another thing that Jesus said in that verse, he said, as I have loved you, so love each other. That's the benchmark for our love, which I got to say is a pretty high benchmark because if you think about how Jesus loved us, he served, he sacrificed, he laid his life down. And he said, as I have loved you, so you should love each other. That is a real challenge. Think about your immediate family. Think about your church family. Have you been sacrificing? Have you been serving? Have you been laying your life down for others? We've all seen images uh, in the media the last couple of weeks of every man for himself, you know, elderly people getting knocked over in shopping centers trying to grab a toilet roll. I mean, it just seems crazy. But Christ calls us to live differently to that. In fact, he calls us to live in the complete opposite right. of that. We're called to love, we're called to give, and we're called to serve. And there is a big picture here because, you know, Jesus said that as we do this, as we love each other, it actually uh, shows the world that we're his disciples. And it, it, I guess it is a, a, an attractive thing for the world. As we love our fellow believers, our brothers and sisters in Christ, 
that impacts the world. And you can understand, I mean, we all want to feel that love, both physically and spiritually, we crave it. And so you can understand how that can be an attractive thing to the world as, as a non-believer sees two Christians serving one another and sharing and caring for one another, it's going to have an impact. When I was a kid, I memorized the golden rule. I don't know if you've ever memorized it. Matthew 7, 12 says, do to others whatever you would like them to do to you. We act first. We treat people the way we would want them to treat us. It's not the other way around where we say, well, you've treated me nicely. I'll treat you nicely in return. Jesus is actually calling us to love others, to treat others the way we would like to be treated. But then in that verse, Matthew 7, 12, Jesus says, this is the essence of all that is taught in the law and the prophets. So you think about the law and the prophets, that's most of the Old Testament. And he sums it up into one line, do to others whatever you would like them to do to you. Mm -hmm. There's another time that Jesus encapsulates you know, the, the entire uh, Ten Commandments. Someone asked him, what was the greatest commandment? He summed it up, and once again, it relates to love, showing love to God and man. This is in Matthew 22, verses 37 to 40. When he was asked what the greatest commandment was, Jesus said, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Yeah. And then he says, once again, all the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. So these are, I guess, challenging verses, I believe, because it's not something that comes naturally to us sometimes. But we've got to think about how can we actually live this out, and particularly in the environment that we find ourselves in now, where there is a lot of, I guess, that uh, sense of, you know, am I going to be okay? Am I, are my needs being met? But can we live counterculturally to that and actually love and serve other people? Now, we're in the middle of our uh, benevolence offering at church here, which is uh, started last week and continues this week and then next week, again, encouraging you to contribute towards uh, the benevolence fund. And this wasn't something that we just decided last week to do. This has been planned for months. And I really believe that this is God's divine timing for this because you know over the next uh, weeks and months there are going to be many needs uh, that will need to be met and it would be easy to think that or maybe it's a bad time to be asking uh, for money but the reality is that uh, I believe that as the church is able to be generous and care for those uh, within our uh, family that it actually is going to be a blessing to them but also a great witness to the world around us. Amen. So contributing to the benevolence offering is actually a great way to express our love for our brothers and sisters in Christ. Now, I read earlier about um, that passage in Acts 4 that talked about the uh, early church sharing everything and having everything in common. And I said that it was completely voluntary. Now, I want to highlight in uh, chapter 5 of Acts where Ananias and Sapphira, they sold a block of land. And they only gave part of the proceeds to the church. Now, it could be easily misunderstood that because, as you know, the story, they actually died because of this whole situation. But the misunderstanding can come that they died because they withheld some of the funds. But that wasn't the case. If you read in Acts 5, verse 4, Peter's speaking to Ananias and he said, while it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, he's talking about a block of land. After it was sold, was it not in your own control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. So the reason that Ananias and Sapphira were judged so harshly was because they lied to the Holy Spirit. It wasn't because they kept some of the money. The money was theirs. Peter says, the land was yours. You can do what you like with it. You sold it. You didn't have to give all the money. It, wasn't, it was yours to do with what you wanted. But the fact that they gave the portion and pretended like it was the whole amount is actually what the Holy Spirit was judging them for. Yeah. So I really want to encourage you as you consider this benevolence offering. I mean, as I said, it's a it's challenging times and it, it's counterculture to think, oh well, you know, my job you know, maybe 
uh, impacted. Maybe you've already lost work. Or maybe you're, yeah, things are shaky. You don't know what the future is going to hold. So to think, well, in the middle of all that, why should I be giving uh, money to a benevolence offering? But I really want you to pray and ask God to, to speak to you. Ask God what you would do and then be obedient. Just simply be obedient to his voice. There's no obligation. There's no pressure, but simply an encouragement to obey God's voice at this time. Yeah. Now, you may say, I'm generous. I give to different individuals or causes as I feel led. Why do I have to give to a church benevolence offering as well? Well, in response to that, I would say that putting our money into a larger pool simply enables us to bless more people. It actually multiplies the impact of our giving and enables us to be able to uh, support uh, more people in, in different ways. As we give into a corporate fund, the opportunities to bless others increases exponentially. And yeah, the early church got this, you know, in um, back in Acts chapter 4, a couple of verses on in 34 and 35, it says there were no needy people among them because those who owned land or houses would sell them and bring the money to the apostles to give to those in need. Once again, I believe that the level of generosity that the early church experienced was directly linked to the revelation that they had of a God who generously gave his only son so the price for sin could be paid. If you desire to be more generous, I believe that a personal revelation of God's great generosity towards you is all you need. We owed a debt, the debt of sin, and we couldn't pay it. There's no way that we could pay that debt, but Jesus willingly chose to lay his life down to pay that debt on our behalf. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. As I was preparing this message, I noticed something else that I hadn't seen before. A number of verses in the Bible speak about giving or generosity, and they also include the word righteousness or the righteous. Let me give you a few examples. 2 Corinthians 9, verses 8 to 11, it says, And God is able to bless you abundantly, so that in all things at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor, their righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. Now, just a note on that too, it says in there, he supplies seed to the sower. So he doesn't give seed to the hoarder. He provides mm -hmm. seed to the yeah. sower. So that's actually, you know, um, as we are generous, as we step out in faith and sow, God actually promises to supply seed to us. Another example is in Psalms. Psalms 112 verses 5 to 9. I might get still to come up and read that to us. No, I'm only joking. <laughs> I just wanted to put her in front of the camera. <clears throat> Psalm 112, verses 5 to 9. You've gone all red, Sil. Good will come to those who are generous and lend freely, who conduct their affairs with justice. Surely the righteous will never be shaken. They will be remembered forever. They will have no fear of bad news. Their hearts are steadfast, trusting in the Lord. Their hearts are secure. They will have no fear. In the end, they will look in triumph, on their foes they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor their righteousness endures forever their horn will be lifted high in honor by the way horn means power and dignity i was a bit thinking what does a horn mean their horn is lifted high in honor but it means power and dignity another example is psalm 37 21 the wicked borrow and do not repay but the righteous give generously. So you can see the link, and there's lots of other examples in the scriptures where generosity and righteousness are linked. And I was looking online at an English thesaurus that said righteousness and generosity are semantically related. And I'd never even noticed this before, but uh, you can see that uh, in the scriptures. Interestingly, the reverse is also true. In Luke 11.39, Jesus rebuked the Pharisees for their greed and wickedness. And greed and wickedness 
are often linked together in scripture, just as generosity and righteousness go together as well. So this poses a bit of a chicken and egg conundrum for us. Which comes first? If we are generous, does that increase our righteousness? So we might say, well, I want to be more righteous, so I'll be more generous and that'll make me more righteous. Well, that actually uh, is counterproductive because the reality is that's doing it in our own strength and our own works. But we need to actually uh, plug into Christ's righteousness yeah. and that will actually result yeah. in a greater yeah. generosity. Relying on God's grace and mercy is the Amen. key. Romans chapter 3, I want to read these, these verses to you. Once again, talking about the righteousness of Christ. Romans 3, 21 to 23. But now the righteousness of God, apart from the law, is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe. For there is no difference for all of sin. And fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation for his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness. Because in his forbearance, God had passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Yeah. What a great promise. You know, Amen. Jesus is our substitute. That word propitiation, it's a big word, but it just simply means a substitute. Jesus came and he died in our place. That's a wonderful promise. It's a great truth from the scriptures. And as he's done that, and as we accept that and actually put our faith and our trust in him, we take on his righteousness. When God looks at us as believers, he sees Jesus. He sees a perfectly righteous man. And that's a great a great truth to hold on to. 1 John 4 10 is another example of this. It says, This is real love, not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. In another version, that's the NLT there, but in another version, it says, He sent His Son as propitiation for our sins. So, once again, just reinforcing the fact that Jesus was our substitute. He assumed our obligations and covered it by the punishment which he cross. And as we get a grasp of that, as we, I guess, get a fresh revelation of that, the righteousness that we have in Christ, I believe that it will result, the fruit of that will result in a greater level of generosity in our lives. When we accept the sacrifice, put our faith in Jesus and recognize the price that he paid, we take on his righteousness. And when we live out our lives aware of that, we become more generous. It flows out of us as we become more Christ-like. So I want to leave that with you as an encouragement this morning to consider uh, our righteousness and our generosity. And once again, to remind us about this benevolence offering, it is uh, this week and next week you can continue to give. Uh, there's an envelope on your seat. No, there's not really, but you can give online, of course. If you do it online, just put the word benevolence in the um, reference reference field so that we can designate it and all those funds are going to be set aside and as I said I mean there are going to be plenty of opportunities uh, for us as a church to support uh, our church family there are going to be many people that are going to be facing different challenges in the weeks and months ahead and I really want to encourage us as a church to be loving to care and share uh, for those around us we can do that uh, ourselves caring for our neighbours and, and other people. But I really believe that as we sow into uh, this corporate fund and give a benevolence offering, that God will bless that and God will be able to multiply it and put it to good use. So I really want to encourage you to uh, to consider that. As I said, there's no, no pressure, but it's just a, an opportunity for us to respond in faith instead of responding in fear and put, uh, you know, put legs in our faith uh, by giving in that way. So I just want to pray and ask God's blessing on us today. Lord, I thank you for the fact that you generously gave your son Jesus to come to earth and die the death that we should have died. Jesus, I thank you that when we put our faith in you, that we take on your righteousness. Give us a greater revelation, Lord, of just what that means. And I pray that the fruit of that revelation will be a greater level of generosity, especially to our Christian brothers and sisters. 
And I just want to encourage you, if you're watching this today, I don't know how many people are watching or where you are watching. I don't know what your relationship is with Christ. Maybe you are watching this and you actually have never given your heart to the Lord. Maybe you've never actually taken that first step and said, Jesus, I want to take on your righteousness. I've got sin in my life. I can't do anything about that. But Jesus, you have done something about that. I want to encourage you to take that step. Put your trust and your faith in Jesus. Take on his righteousness. And when you do that, the Bible says that you'll be given a new heart with new and right desires. That generosity will well up from within you. The righteousness of Christ will make a change in your life. People will notice. And of course, the wonderful thing is that we'll have abundant life, not just here on earth, but eternal life with Christ. The relationship with God will be restored as we give our hearts to him. So I want to encourage you, if, if that's you, to, to pray a simple prayer and just say, God, I am sorry for the things I've done wrong. I'm sorry for uh, living a life without acknowledging you. And I want to ask you to come into my life and change my heart, forgive my sins, make me a new person. And if you do that today, I really want to encourage you to, to contact us. You, know, you can message us through the Facebook page and let us know of the decision because we'd love to uh, celebrate that with you and uh, walk with you on your journey of faith. So I really want to just pray a blessing over everyone today. Thanks for being a part of this and tuning in. Uh, it's been wonderful to watch the way that the, the church family just been banding together in creative ways because obviously things are so different to what uh, what we are used to. But Continue to connect, continue to be involved and continue to seek God to see what he's wanting to say in you and through you. So I'll just pass back over to Pastor Harry.